From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. Let's get a check on the markets as we do every day with Abigail Doolittle. So, Abigail, equity markets are up mildly. There's been some encouraging news and stimulus, but you're the expert. What's really going on? Oh, David, I think that uh, you may be the expert on this one because we've had some interesting off-air uh, conversations. And I think that you're right in terms of the stimulus right now on the table, showing the idea that there's some bipartisan support, that some sort of a deal will get done. Not too big, not too small, perhaps just right. So we have more record highs here for the S&P 500. The top sector, once again, energy. So that's very encouraging around the idea of stimulus and also the recovery of the economy, because that would, in theory, uh, cause some demand uh, for oil. We also have the Russell 2000, that small cap index, rallying even more, up 1%. Not a record high there, but nonetheless, stocks right across the board rallying. A piece of it, of course, is the dollar. The dollar is weak, down about half a percent, uh, not quite breaking down technically. Uh, interesting stuff going on there. Expect some more volatility. Uh, in, in fact, a strong economy in a perfect world, a healthy world, would bring about a strong dollar. Let's see whether or not that happens. And then finally, David, just uh, in the last couple of minutes, some breaking news. OPEC has agreed to a small production hike uh, in the new year. Oil initially dipped ever so slightly on that, now up ever so slightly. Not really big news. So oil, a little bit of a roller coaster there, uh, but net net small gains and small losses. Right now, oil up about half a percent, excuse me, three tenths of one percent, pretty much the same amount that the S&P 500 is up again on a new record high. Yeah, and oil may have priced in that result from OPEC Plus just a little bit. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. We've been talking about stimulus. Time is really running short to get it done, but we are seeing some progress now with a bipartisan group of senators proposing a slimmed down version of about $908 billion. And President-elect Biden yesterday signaling he might well go for that. To take us through the bidding, we welcome now Courtney Rosenberger. She is strategic Director of Policy Research. So, Courtney, welcome back. It's good to have you here. Uh, I, I, have the odds gone up on stimulus before the month is out? Yeah, thank you for having me. This is probably the most optimistic we've really been about another round of stimulus since the talk started, you know, back earlier this year. Um, um, President-elect Biden and Janet Yellen really gave Speaker Pelosi cover to come out in support of the moderate proposal for $908 billion. But, you know, there's still a lot of problems to go with it. We might not be bridging a $1.5 trillion gap now, but we still have a $500 billion gap where the moderate proposal is and where um, Majority Leader McConnell is. And there's not really a clear path forward for how that for how those differences get bridged. Exactly. And the Majority Leader Mitch McConnell came out today and spoke on the floor and said that stimulus compromise is within reach, to use his terms. But one of the things mm -hmm. that looks to me like there's a real gap on is the assistance for states, because in this bipartisan proposal, there's $160 billion for state and local government and then another $82 billion for education. Thus far, the Republicans seem to have dug in their heels on that one. They have. They don't want to do additional funding for the states. And we have actually seen Speaker Pelosi say that she would like more funding for the states in whatever negotiated package gets dealt with. So that's one of the key areas where there's disagreement. And again, there's not a clear path forward for how they're going to bridge those differences uh, to come to an overall deal for a $1 trillion size package. We could still see some agreement for a smaller package to do some type of extension for you know, unemployment benefits and moratoriums on evictions. But, you know, there's still a lot of problems, as we've discussed, that have to be dealt with to get another $1 billion or $1 trillion package passed. They also have to renew authorization to spend money for on behalf of the entire U.S. government. I think the deadline <laughs> of that is December 11. Is it likely it is. that given the shortness of time, they might have to combine those two things? So we could see the extension. What they've been trying to do is get the stimulus tagged on to the funding for the government. We could certainly see extensions for the unemployment insurance and the moratorium on evictions tagged onto that as well. We could also see maybe a one-week continuing resolution just so they have more time to fund the government because that December 11th deadline is quickly approaching. As I said, we heard from the president-elect, Joe Biden, yesterday, and what he said, as I recall, is this is a good down payment, this bipartisan mm -hmm. $908 billion, suggesting they're going to come back in the next Congress and go for more. Uh, what are the chances that they can get a second round of stimulus in the first quarter of next year? 
It really depends on the Senate. So the Georgia runoffs in January are going to be key to that. If the Republicans retain control of the Senate, this is probably going to be the last shot for stimulus. The closer that we get to a vaccine, the harder it is to come to some type of a deal. You know, we've seen Speaker Pelosi come down from a $3 trillion package, and now we're talking about a $908 billion package. And a lot of that's because Republicans are going to be more resistant to doing large funding packages as we get closer to reopening. So an awful lot hinges on those two runoff elections, uh, January 5th. How does an investor price that in? I mean, uh, how do they take an uh, an assessment? What is your assessment of the likelihood? Because, frankly, the Democrats would have to take both seats, right, to really make a difference. Yep, they have to take both seats to get to 50-50. We are still anticipating that Republicans are going to win at least one of those seats, but the odds have come down. You know, Republicans really have to rely on turnout to take, take the seats. And with the um, issues with the election in the past couple of weeks, you know, there are some concerns from Republican leadership that they might be risking Senate control. But as you said, there's a lot that hinges on this. So it's another round of stimulus. It could be taxes as well. They can certainly pass tax increases with a 50-50 Senate uh, with Vice President Harris being the 51st vote. Well, it goes one way. It may go the other way as well. I wonder whether people's chances of prevailing in Georgia actually may turn on whether a stimulus gets done or not, because the, the expectations are building up. Even as we've been talking, the headlines come out on the, on the terminal from President Trump saying that he will support a stimulus deal if Congress gets one done. So this is he's mm-hmm. appearing in the Oval Office actually presenting a Presidential Medal of Freedom, and he made those remarks. It seems like there's an hydraulic pressure right now, and the disappointment will be if they don't get a stimulus deal done. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of concerns from Republicans, and that's part of the reason why I've seen some of the Republicans say that they would do this you know, $908 billion deal. You know, there's concerns that if you have unemployment expansions coming off at the end of this year, that's going to hurt them because of the headline risk going into the January runoff for the Georgia Senate. They don't want bad headlines, you know, as the stake of the Senate, as the Senate controls at stake. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating as we t- take a look at these off these uh, these runoff elections and their significance here. Coming back to the stimulus bill for a second, uh, as a practical matter, what difference will it make in terms of getting money into people's pockets? So, so what we've seen for the nine hundred eight billion dollars is that does not include individual checks in it. Um, Speaker Pelosi has said that she would like to include individual checks. We saw that actually from the White House in an op-ed last night from um, Peter Navarro and Tyler Goodspeed that they would also like individual checks to be included. The president has been pretty adamant that he wants individual checks included, but that's not part of the bill right now. And certainly that's an added price tag. You know, when you're talking about $908 billion and um, Majority Leader McConnell being hesitant about that size, once you put individual checks in that as well, you're adding, you know, at least 200 or $300 billion into that potentially. Yeah, you referred to that op-ed in the Wall Street Journal from Peter Navarro and also Tyler Goodspeed from the White House. We're not clear on whether the President Trump really approved that or not, but I thought it was interesting. They were very explicit. This is not stimulus, they said. This is a bridge because this is going to get us mm-hmm. to a vaccine. And to some extent, isn't that what Congress is dealing with here? Yeah, that's that's certainly how Republicans are viewing it, and that's how Speaker Pelosi and and Vice Pres- and President-elect Biden have said it as well. They're talking about it as a bridge to when we get to the vaccine. You know, the problem is that Republicans view this as kind of the last package, and Democrats view it as a bridge to the vaccine and then doing another package afterwards. But they do, as we've said, you know, they need Senate control to do that. It's fascinating. Thank you so much for being back with us. Appreciate it. It's Courtney Rosenberger. She is Strategist, Director of Policy Research. Coming up, we're going to have more on that big OPEC Plus meeting today and the deal they just announced. Dan Jurgen of IHS Market is here on how significant that deal really is. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. I'm David Weston. We have some breaking news right now involving the Federal Reserve. The Senate has just voted to confirm Christopher Waller to the Federal Reserve Board. We know Christopher Waller it was a part of the Federal Reserve System. He was executive vice president and head of, of, of research for the St. Louis Fed. When he was nominated, he was nominated along with Judy Shelton, an economic advisor to President Trump. One was very controversial. That would be Ms. Shelton. One was not. That was Christopher Waller. A lot of people who know the Federal Reserve expected this kind of and now it has come through, and we are joined to take us through it, an expert on the Federal Reserve, and he is our colleague, Mike McKee. So, Mike, as I say, I don't think this is a big surprise. 
Not a big surprise, Chris Waller's nomination was never particularly controversial, unlike many of the others that Donald Trump put forward. Waller has a good reputation as the research director at the St. Louis Fed. He's done a lot of work on the independence of the Fed, which is a key topic for people who are working there, as well as for uh, many up on Capitol Hill. And he is a key player in the regime uh, way of looking at the economy that the St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard uses, the idea that you don't need to change interest rates until the economy moves into a different regime. And right now we're in a low inflation, low growth regime. So uh, he is expected to be on the dovish side. Not that anybody on the Fed at this point, David, isn't dove. Yeah, exactly right. It's hard to t tell a dog for, uh, a, a dove from a hawk right now. But so that goes to the question, actually, sort of your, our own version of a dot plot here. Uh, would he be more of a centrist, do you think, of the Federal Reserve? Will he uh, tend to move the Fed in one direction or another? Well, if you were seeing the Fed move, he would probably move them on uh, the dovish side. His academic reputation is very strong. He used to teach at Notre Dame uh, economics before going to the St. Louis Fed. But the question is, uh, at this point, does he join in the Bullard regime? Because Bullard's dots are always at zero because he doesn't <laughs> think that they should move at this point and doesn't make predictions that they will. So that'll be something to watch for when they, we get the next dot plot. Uh, I assume he will be sworn in and be able to take part in the December 16th meeting. Okay, thank you so much. Really appreciate it to our colleague, Bloomberg's Michael McKee. OPEC Plus has agreed to a small production hike on January 1st, according to delegates, and then we are reviewing it every month thereafter. To explain the significance of this decision, welcome now Daniel Jurgen, Vice Chairman of IHS Market. So it happened just a short time ago, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us on this. As I understand what they've said, is we'll go up 500,000 barrels a day, and then we'll take a look every month. Is this going to do what the market needs? Does this make a a profound difference in the market overall? Yes, uh, David. What it does is basically says that the deal is not going to break up. When you have 23 nations that come together and uh, in the, looking in an abyss at negative oil prices, they make a deal that everybody sticks together. As prices start going up, people start looking at their own interests. Saudi Arabia has one view, Russia another view, uh, the UAE another view. But I think that uh, they could not afford to not have a deal. And uh, there are a lot of... Uh, digital bilaterals that had to happen to make this happen. But this kind of is a, is a gradual one that does ultimately get to what they'd agreed to in terms of bringing production back. But it just shows you, David, how hard it is to bring seven and a half million barrels of oil uh, over a year back into the market. Exactly, particularly given this market. Just one p part of, forgive the expression, criminology here. I'm hearing some people say it was important that Russia was presiding. They were chairing the meeting rather than Saudi Arabia. Do you put any stock in that? I think so. I think um, uh, Minister Novak was one of the uh, uh, architects of the whole deal, the Russian, and um, the Saudi uh, co-chair, uh, the petroleum minister, uh, Abdulaziz bin Salman, decided he didn't want to be in the chair. And so the figure of stability was uh, as somebody who's not part of OPEC, but part of the non-OPEC group. So it sends a message about the Russians' focus on stability. Uh, so they had to delay the meeting because there was enough contention. They couldn't really get to an agreement quite. And, and the contention, as I understand it, came from a quarter that I didn't appreciate, which is Saudi Arabia and UAE. Usually I think of it as Saudi Arabia and Russia. What was the bone of contention between Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates? Yeah, yeah the, actually Saudi Arabia and Russia has been the basis of this whole agreement from the beginning. Uh, the UAE has said that they want to increase production. They didn't like the fact that other countries were cheating. Uh, they seem to uh, want to, they've raised questions about what's the framework here. I think they want to monetize their oil. So there was a degree of uh, tension between uh, those two countries in terms of their point of view, which normally they're pretty much in lockstep. So that's an example of the divergence of interests that uh, uh, exist, particularly as prices start going up again in anticipation of vaccine. Well, that, that's key, it seems to be, that, as you say, the prices started going up again, because I took a look at oil over a period of time over the course of the year, and it has been moving its way back up. Is that really uh, triggering the dispute right now about whether to increase production? Yes, because uh, I think when prices start going up, the divergence of interest, I mean, the oil price has basically been stuck in what I call the, uh, the virus alley, and like a lot of other parts of the economy, and in terms of getting out, it's been torn between the one hand now vaccine optimism and the other hand virus pessimism. Uh, but uh, as it's now basically looking towards uh, the springtime when it's possible that a lot of people in countries where you have had economic shutdown, like the United States or Europe, 
will be back and motor cars and demand will be going up again. Dan, we spend almost every day looking at the equity markets, at least here in the United States, and how they've been going up. And it's generally thought that's because we are anticipating a vaccine sometime at least toward the middle of next year. Does the oil market work that way? I mean, are oil prices being affected already by the prospect of a widely distributed vaccine by the middle of 2021? Uh, absolutely. It's signaling it and that, uh, that uh, that's when you'll start to see demand going up. Of course, there's some things hanging out there. For instance, if the Biden administration starts to move to try and reopen the door with Iran, that could mean a lot of Iranian oil coming back into the market. So there's a whole geopolitical drama that's happening at the same time. But it's certainly uh, expectations of a vaccine and kind of confidence and hope beyond what looks like an, a very difficult 12 weeks that we have ahead from a health point of view. At the same time, we see China coming back faster, I think it's fair to say, than the United States and Europe. Is that helping drive the price of oil in and of itself right now? Give us a sense of what the China resurgence is doing. Yeah, it's uh, sent a, a message that was not expected because uh, people thought, you know, demand would be weak. Chinese oil demand now is higher than it was at this time last year. So it, it, I think that is figuring in that people see that you get recovery and with recovery comes increased demand. And, uh, you know, this is a market that has been very hit, hard hit by the reduction in demand because of the freezing up of activity. And there seems to be indication that demand is, is really back uh, in India as well. And that's another signal that the market's looking at. Uh, moving over to the supply side, uh, you mentioned the possibility of Iran coming back online if, in fact, a Biden administration comes to terms with them. Libya already, as I understand it, is producing again more than it was before. Uh, how much oil is sitting out there that could come back in on the production side? Well, if you add what has uh, been out because of the uh, OPEC Plus deal, uh, at this point, that's seven and a half million barrels. Then you have another, that all won't come back at once. They're trying to have a structure for that. But you could have three million barrels a day of Iranian oil coming back and possibly something with Venezuela too. So that is uh, hanging out there. And it looks like the Trump administration is doing everything it can to put together uh, an anti, uh, stronger anti-Iranian coalition to make things more difficult for uh, a Biden administration. Uh, what is the effect at this point of U.S. shale? I mean, it's been a huge effect. You, you have it in the, the new map, your new book, uh, about the effect of U.S. shale. How is that affecting the oil market right now? Well, shale has uh, come down a lot. Uh, you, we reached an incredible high point of 13 million barrels a day in February, ahead of Saudi Arabia, ahead of Russia. We're still ahead of Saudi Arabia and Russia because of their cutbacks but it's down about 2 million barrels a day. And I don't think we'll see a recovery until the middle of next year, until you start to see a demand going up and uh, prices getting really getting out of uh, virus alley. Dan, as you suggest, the big issue, I think it's for the world, but certainly for the oil industry, is what happens with the vaccine and the vaccine coming back on. We also have a change in administrations coming up here in the United States, and we have what looks to be a quite a different approach to energy coming in from a President Biden when he takes office January 20. How big a factor is that likely to be? Well, well, I think in a way, I, the way I was listening to your previous interview and thinking that really the presidential election really isn't over until uh, January 5th, and we know the yeah. outcome of Georgia because that will affect what the Biden administration can and can't do with, on climate. But it is said that climate is one of its four priorities. John Kerry has been appointed as climate uh, envoy. Every cabinet secretary will have a climate objective. So, And the United States will re-engage with the global climate Paris consensus. So it will be a pretty big change, I think. Uh, but he's also made clear that there's no ban on fracking, that there'll be more regulation. And that fits, doesn't it, with the thesis of your book, The New Map, frankly, that uh, we can't blink our eyes and have oil go away. It's not going away anytime soon. No, I mean, there are 280 million cars in the United States and 279 million of them roughly run on gasoline. So I think that directionally we know where things are going to go towards lower carbon, but this is something that will unfold over decades. Uh, last year, we had an $87 trillion world economy. 80% of it rested on fossil fuels. That doesn't change overnight. At the same time, is there a fair amount that the Biden administration can do, even without control of the Senate, which you correctly point out is not going to be determined until late January? But are there things such as fuel efficiency standards that really could make a difference? You already see well, a difference with respect to the conflict between California and Washington. Yeah, I think on a regulatory front, they were, that's where they will have a lot of impact. I also think the regulatory agencies like the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, even the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, and uh, executive orders 
So I think that they will look at, uh, at uh, all the different tools and, that they have, but it will be easier in terms of getting money for what they want to achieve if they also control the Senate. Okay, thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to have you with us. That's Dan Juergen. He's IHS Market Vice Chairman, and he's also author, as I said, of The New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations. Still ahead, Boeing strikes a deal with Ryanair, and shares are flying high. Get the pun? That's next on our Stock of the Hour. This is Balance Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Our stock of the hour today is Boeing. After it announced a big order from Irish discount airline Ryanair just today, Emma Chandra is here to take us from, from London to take us through what the deal looks like. So, Emma, what is this deal? It's a big deal. It is a very big deal, a monster deal. It's being described as a major boost uh, for Boeing. This is Europe's most valuable airline. That's Ryanair places a really big order. 75 planes for its once embattled 737 MAX jet. Those 75 planes are added to an existing order to bring a total of 210 for Ryanair of the 737 MAX jet. 50 of them will be delivered next year. Now, this kind of order worth uh, on list price about $9.4 billion uh, for Boeing. Now, airlines typically get uh, big discounts when they place these sorts of orders. We don't know how big a discount uh, Ryanair is getting, and we certainly know that C the CEO of Ryanair, uh, Michael O'Leary, likes to drive a hard bargain. They are getting some compensation uh, for delayed delivery, but whichever way you slice it, this is really good for Boeing. It's a big uh, vote of confidence in that 737 max jet it's a seal of approval really from Ryanair and remember of course this was once one of the world's best-selling aircraft 900 around 900 aircraft delivered back in 2017 just over a hundred so far this year and that's of course because the plane was grounded for 20 months after those two fatal aircraft um, air, air, air crashes uh, now of course only in the last month we're hearing uh, from the US Federal Aviation Authority that it is cleared to fly again so Boeing of course very pleased that it's getting this seal of approval from Europe, David. Yeah, and ramifications not just for Boeing itself, but all those suppliers and things. There could be a lot of jobs back here in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. And so we're looking at other airlines. Are they going to follow where Ryanair leads? And also looking at those suppliers you mentioned, and we're seeing some of uh, Boeing's biggest suppliers getting stock pops today. We're talking about Raytheon. We're talking about GE and also Spirit Aerosystems, David. Okay, thank you so much, Emma Chandra, for that report from London on Boeing and Ryanair. Up next, Republican Senator Bill Cassie, Louisiana, on his stimulus compromise on COVID and on the transition. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. President-elect Biden is continuing his transition to the White House with the announcement of more key appointments. Politico says the president-elect has chosen Jeff Zients to serve as his COVID czar. Politico also says that Mr. Biden has tapped Vivek Murthy to be Surgeon General. And according to the New York Times, Brian Deese will head the National Economic Council. Deese played a major role in bailing out the automotive industry and negotiating the Paris Climate Agreement under President Obama. The number of Americans hospitalized for COVID-19 is at a record high. The Department of Health and Human Services says more than 14% of hospital beds in U.S. hospitals are now taken by coronavirus patients. Texas has the highest number of beds occupied by COVID patients with more than 9,200. Rhode Island has the greatest percentage of beds taken by virus patients at 23.7%, followed by North Dakota at 23.1%. On Capitol Hill, Democrats are making a bid to break the standoff on a new stimulus package. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer are scaling back demands on a plan retreating from the $2.4 trillion pandemic package they had been pushing. 
The two now say a $908 billion proposal from a bipartisan group of lawmakers should serve as the baseline for negotiations with congressional Republicans and the White House. Spain's government is weighing the benefits of a four-day work week to boost the number of people who are employed. The idea of a shorter work week has been around for years, but the pandemic and its impact on work, well-being and inequality has led to a new push to think about economies and social structures. The huge use of furlough programs has spurred calls for greater support for low earners and those in vulnerable industries. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Well, it's less than a month to go until Britain exits from the European Union, agreement or no. And negotiations remain hard at work, saying it will be difficult, but it is still possible to get a deal done. Welcome now, Stephanie Flanders, Bloomberg Senior Executive Editor for Economics. Stephanie, thank you so much for being with us. I must say, it's been, th what, three years, four years now? And it seems like the issues are about the same. we got to worry about regulatory consistency. we got to worry about state aid. we got to worry about fish. <laughs> but isn't the, doesn't there come a time when you just have to, so to speak, fish or cut bait, make some decisions and do it or not do it? Well, and of course, it's those kind of phrases that have been used over the last few weeks, as we've had increasingly felt that we were just on the edge of an agreement. Uh, and that was true last week. And we know that it was delayed. Any any fur final furlong uh, was, was delayed by the fact that one of the negotiators actually uh, was exposed to COVID and everyone had to go into uh, quarantine for, for some period of time. But uh, every day now, um, we talk to our reporters uh, and the word on the street, uh, we are hearing that it's about to come a deal. I have to say the mood music the last few days has actually been less positive. And I think that's partly the feeling that, hang on a minute, we thought we knew what needed to happen. You mentioned those three deals. You know, the general perception is that on those three sticking points, uh, it's uh, Britain, uh, probably Boris Johnson himself, who will need to give a little bit on this language around a level playing field where Britain sort of promises that it's not going to try and use its new freedom to get an enormous competitive advantage against uh, Europe in return for the Europeans then asking for what the British would say was a more reasonable amount of access to British waters. It's amazing how important this 0.1% of the economy, yeah. the fishing uh, has become in this negotiation. And of course, many in the financial sector, uh, the city is so important, uh, would say, hang on a minute, we were sold down the river years ago and you're still, uh, the fish fishermen are still in there battling away for their rights. It does seem like a very topsy-turvy negotiation. Yeah, as we would say, them's politics is a practical matter. But we have the British on the one side, and, and I think it's fair to say the, the British position has not always been perfectly consistent. But on the other hand, are we having dissension over on the European side? Because now there are reports that maybe they don't think Michel Barnier is really cluing them in on what the terms are. There was even a Bloomberg report saying that, in fact, France might be threatening to veto whatever Mr. Barnier negotiates. You know, the French have always had a very, have been the sort of uh, the muscular side of the negotiations and certainly have had more muscular uh, rhetoric, uh, feisty rhetoric throughout this process. We know they've quite actively talked about uh, taking advantages for Paris's financial sector for this, for sure, um, but also about uh, Britain be, you know, being absolutely sure that Britain doesn't get a deal that any other country might look at and say, oh, I'd like, I want one like that. Um, whether that's sort of classic, uh, not to play to too many stereotypes, but is it the sort of, you know, Gallic uh, desire to sound to sound macho or whether there's something more fundamental there, a real disagreement? Uh, I'm not so sure. I and mean, what has been really striking throughout, you pointed to the inconsistencies on the British side. In general, the Europeans, this is a lot of countries with a lot of different interests in this negotiation, have been remarkably of one voice throughout. And I suspect that will continue even if you get a little muttering around the edges. What is the real deadline? I mean, there are so many deadlines. Now I'm hearing like December 18, because they do have to get ratification, right, after they get a deal done. Yeah, and it's been interesting because the, the British set a deadline of October, middle of October, a while ago. So that was the sort of drop dead date. Um, the Europeans were always a bit sort of poo pooed that. Then it went through November. I interviewed the Irish Prime Minister uh, a few weeks ago for the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. He thought the deadline could slip into the middle of December. Now they are talking about a bit later. I think the idea is once you get into that kind of territory, 
everything would be provisional. You wouldn't be able to get ratification in the European Parliament. And in a sense, you'd be prolonging the agony because you would, you would still be having to go back and finalise this deal that you did already in the final hour. So I think people are hoping that we won't be pushing those further deadlines, um, not least because the, the new vaccine that Britain has just uh, confirmed, has to, we haven't got it from Belgium yet, and we certainly don't want to get shipments to be interfered with uh, come January. So we're all going to need to be watching this very, very closely over the coming days and weeks. By the way, if they don't get a deal done by Jan by December 31, can they just keep negotiating into the new year? I understand WTO restrictions will come into effect, but why couldn't they deal do a deal on January 15 or January 30? You know, we've we, we found that before that these things can be can be more flexible. I think that the the, real, the problem is that the potential of extending the transition period was absolutely ruled out after the summer. Um, there was a deadline. I think it was in August. Uh, where the British had to apply for an extension. And they, they said, despite COVID, despite everything else, the government was adamant it wouldn't have an extension. So legally, you're right that the change has to happen on January 1st. Whether you'd have enough goodwill, enough desire to negotiate with the same kind of pace and energy when you've already crashed through that crucial legal deadline, I'm not so sure. But yeah, technically, they could carry on talking. So it's not just Brexit that's important coming up in the coming days. We also have an ECB meeting next week. And there's a lot of talk about what the ECB would do, needs to do as a practical matter. You've got some deflation pressures, I know, at least in some parts of Europe right now. They're very concerned. I just saw a piece about Spain, for example, a lot of concern there. At the same time, the euro is pretty strong. So do they have some maneuver room, as it were? Yeah, and I think it's been, it's an interesting dance. And we've talked to, the Bloomberg's had an extraordinary number of interviews with ECB governing council members over the last few weeks on this very subject. And I think uh, what one thing that's clear is that, they, you know, they're struggling with the short term and the longer term. In the short term, you've still got most of, a lot of the European uh, economy in lockdown, in the second wave of lockdowns, um, and some support needed uh, right now in terms of confidence uh, and some message that there is going to be further help, a last dose of stimulus coming, if you like, a last dose of COVID stimulus, even if you need more uh, other things down the road. But when you're looking at the longer term, we know from part, from the last few months, actually the Eurozone economy, when it doesn't, when it isn't locked down, can bounce back very quickly. Is it really the case that the ECB needs to be giving a lot of support um, beyond the next, uh, the next six months or so? That's actually much more of a debate. And there's still quite a lot of concern about how much the financial markets are being distorted by having these super low rates, not just short rates and long rates. So I think we, we're getting a healthy debate about that, um, which, which goes to this position we're in, where we're kind of almost out of the COVID world, but not quite. Well, exactly. And we've been talking about the possibility of an air pocket, as it's called, you know, where we really have to get through a, here in the United States, a very difficult period of periods on COVID-19 with the expectations by, by the middle of next year, things may bounce back rather resoundingly, provided we get this vaccine distributed. But one of the things we're contending with, as you know, Stephanie, is fiscal versus monetary. You've got that pot of money on the fiscal side, as I understand it, but you're having some trouble getting it distributed. Is that right? I think it, I mean, and certainly in the in the case of the uh, the EU, they've got their their recovery plan, which we've talked about in the past, is a great breakthrough because there it's it involves lending on behalf of all of the eurozone members and then lending out, to, uh, giving giving in some cases and lending um, to European countries large amounts uh, relative to their GDP in the case mm -hmm. of, of Greece and, and Spain. Um, it's not going out the door quite as fast as expected, but I think we're still talking, you know, relative warp speed compared to uh, the way these things have been handled in the past by the EU. So I wouldn't I wouldn't count it out yet. But yes, how do you manage that balance between fiscal and monetary? And of course, that's true also in the US. You know, the Federal Reserve very much wanting to get more fiscal relief out of uh, the U.S. Uh, government, but struggling to do that so far on the Hill. Well, exactly. And what is the sense over on the European side of how you get demand going again? Because you can offer money for free until the cows come home. But if people don't want to borrow because they have nothing constructed to do with it, they're not going to borrow it. Yeah, I mean, this goes to, I think it's um, internationally, we're just having a reassessment of the power of fiscal policy. It used to be said, that uh, it was monetary policy that could be nimble and that could support kind of short-term growth or, or stamp on short-term growth if you were worried about inflation. And fiscal policy was too slow to do anything really useful. You'd end up building a bridge in five years' time when you don't need it. We've really changed our view on that. And we've had, in fact, on my podcast, Stephanomics, we had Jason Furman this week, the former 
Obama uh, Council of Economic Advisors president, talking about the need for a new a revolution in the way we think about fiscal policy and fiscal policy playing a much bigger role in future in supporting growth in a world that we don't have to worry so much about the cost of borrowing. If your government at the moment, many governments around the world, the UK, the US, are, have a mountain of debt higher than they've ever had before relative to the size of the economy, but record low debt service costs. The cost of actually having that debt, carrying that debt, is lower than it's ever been. Should change the way we think about fiscal policy on both sides of the Atlantic. But, but let's just spend a moment on that. Is there a risk at some point, perhaps, of inflation, believe it or not, of interest rates coming back? Because there's some speculation that if, in fact, we do get a widely distributed vaccine, it could change the world rather rapidly. There are those, the people who perhaps cried wolf when a lot of money was going out the door in, after the global financial crisis, a lot of central bank money was being printed and people said, hang on, that's gonna cause inflation in the end. It never happened. Uh, but now those same people, many of them are saying, this time it will because this is actually pent up the money that has been built up on people's balance sheets. All this time they haven't been able to go out to restaurants, they haven't been able to spend. They're now suddenly gonna be able to spend it. And if central banks continue to have all of this money floating around, they don't have a way of pulling, of, of sucking out that liquidity from the system, we could have inflation. I think most people would still say that would be a nice problem to have. We've certainly not seen anything like that in the Eurozone in recent years, and it seems pretty unlikely in the US. Certainly a lot of people in financial markets would, have, would lose a lot of money if we got inflation back, because that is not what's expected. As far as the eye to see, can see, we're looking at, at bets on very low inflation. Very helpful. Always a pleasure to have you with us. That's Stephanie Flanders. She is Bloomberg's senior executive editor for economics. She's also a Wall Street Week contributor, a program that will be appearing tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Television and Radio. More Balance of Power next. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Republican Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland sat down with David Rubenstein for the Peer-to-Peer -peer program, and he started by asking him about a possible presidential run in 2024. Look, I, uh, I, I'm flattered by the, uh, the, the people suggesting that, and I'm not saying I would rule it out, but, but this is the honest truth. I mean, we're, I, I've got uh, a really important, difficult job that I love doing. We're in the middle of a two twin crisis, the economic and health crisis, and I've still got this day job to do until January of 2023, and I'm going to try to stay focused on that. But I do want to be a part of the discussion about uh, where we go as a party and where we go as a country. And so I'm going to I'm going to continue to be involved and speak up and, and, and let people know what I think we should do. But uh, I'm not ready to uh, launch okay. any campaigns. You have said recently that the uh, the virus that is coming back, COVID-19, is coming back in a, in a more virulent state than it was before. And you're very worried that we, you may not have enough hospital beds, enough uh, vaccina vaccinations or vaccines or enough uh, PPE. So what is the situation in Maryland? And are, are you talking to other governors and are they saying they're also worried they might not have enough vaccines, PPE and hospital beds? Well, look, this is uh, something we've all been dealing with for nearly nine months now. And, uh, you know, as much as we'd all like to get back to our normal lives, and it's, I mean, the honest truth is that some of our darkest days are still ahead of us. Um, the virus is spiking out of control all across the country. Our state was doing really well, and we were in better shape than, you know, we're still in better shape than many states, but we were better than 43 uh, other states with respect to our health metrics. But the virus does not recognize state borders, and it keeps coming back around and moving around the country. Uh, we now, uh, you know, we, we had it under control for maybe five months here in our state and in the mid-Atlantic region, but uh, now we have 21 of our state hospitals are uh, uh, over 90% capacity. Uh, we built 6,000 additional hospital beds back in the spring to, to, for surge capacity, which is helping us now. Um, but uh, we're, it, we're still in a really tough spot with respect to uh, the virus and how we're trying to keep it under control. Um, however, we're, the good news is uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Operation Warp Speed and the, va and the vaccine uh, is really way ahead of schedule. Uh, and it's uh, it's like the cavalry is is, is coming uh, to to the rescue. It just is not going to happen as fast as we would like. So we've been working with the 
the current, uh, you know, uh, the Vice President Pence, the Coronavirus Task Force. We've been in communication with the incoming uh, President-elect, and we're working with everybody in the administration. Uh, we will start to get our first uh, doses of the vaccine out to all the states. All the governors are working together. We've had numerous, almost weekly calls with every governor in America, with the folks in Washington, and the White House uh, coronavirus team, and the vice president. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a question of how fast uh, the private sector can ramp up the production of these. We have the distribution networks set up. We're ready to go. Um, between the great cooperation between the federal and state uh, governments. Uh, and now we're just, you know, waiting for the shipments to arrive so we can get them out to as many people as we can. That was Republican Governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan. And this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Yesterday, a group of Republican and Democratic senators proposed a new approach to stimulus, one that in some ways could be seen as splitting the baby, baby to take something some from Solomon. And President-elect Biden promptly gave his approval, at least as a down payment. Welcome now one of the authors of the proposed compromise. He is Republican Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. So, Senator, thank you so much for joining us. Are you going to get this deal done? Uh, we'll see. Clearly, having the U.S. chamber supporting it is huge. Having the, um, uh, Biden, Schumer, and Pelosi, that's huge. And probably most of all, having Republicans and Democrats in both the Senate and the House supporting it is huge. If you're not bipartisan, go home. We're the only game in town in terms of getting it done. So I, I saw that uh, President Trump, in remarks at the Oval Office today, said that if Congress sends him something, he will sign it. So it sounds like he will go along. I wonder one of the, one of the big issues is support for the states, because in looking at the compromises proposed, it looked like one of the big things that's not in there is a lot of money for state support. No, oh, that's not true. We have uh, money for state and local governments. That's something that I personally have been concerned about. We want it to be needs-based, but we absolutely have money there, and that was one of the compromises. We linked it to liability reform. Frankly, Democrats wanted the aid, didn't want the liability reform. Republicans wanted liability, uh, not so hot about aid. So it's kind of one of those things where we worked it through where both win something. Well, that raises the question of Mitch McConnell, because as you say, quite correctly, you've got some state support in there, but that's not something that Mitch McConnell has supported thus far. Yes, but I'm finding a lot of interest on our side. They realize that unless you're bipartisan, go home. The only way something gets through is if you have Democrat and Republican support. Otherwise, it's a show vote. And so the fact that we have both, everybody recognizes that we're just not writing the bill and they're not just writing the bill. Rather, we're all writing the bill. So therefore, there's going to be something which hmm, I wouldn't have it. But you gave me enough of what I want. So let's go with it. Uh, so that's why I think if we get this through, that's the reason why. What do you need to get it through? Not just the votes, but the time, uh, because we do have the deadline coming up on funding the government by December 11. Do you need to combine it with that in order to get it through as a practical matter? That is certainly uh, one mechanism. Uh, and that would be if, if we get it attached to the bigger bill, uh, I would accept that. Uh, on the other hand, we are working over the weekend trying to get language together so that people can review uh, hopefully to have it as a standalone, should a standalone be necessary. So it's kind of like, um, you know, the old Warren Zevon song, Send Lawyers, Guns, and Money. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to do everything as possible to get, you know, whatever we can do to get it done, we are doing. Who's driving it? Uh, I think this is an organic movement by the American people. Look at this. 77% of Americans want another relief package. Uh, people are, you know, people who formerly were opposed say they went home and saw folks in food lines. They recognize something has to be done. It is an organic movement. That said, it then comes down to individual members, both in the Senate and in the House, in both parties. And that's kind of maybe the way the founders wanted it to be. Is anybody taking this as reading against the Georgia runoffs at all, or is that beside the point? You know, of course, it would, it would be disingenuous to say that you, you're not aware of a potential impact. But this is truly something in which there's an incredible amount of goodwill among rank and file in both chambers, both parties, to try and get something done. And yes, we've, we've got something off stage, but that's not the focus. The focus is doing something good for the American people. What about the leadership, uh, the leadership on the Senate and the House side? Are they behind this at this point? Well, we've seen that Schumer and Pelosi have come out for it. Um, and we just had a meeting with uh, Leader McConnell laying out our goals. And he recognizes that this has moved the ball forward. Uh, also recognizes that whatever we get has to have bipartisan investment. And so we continue to work those issues 
um, you know, if we if we get enough of our members, a sh- membership of both parties on board, oftentimes leaders, you know, just recognize it and they move with us. It's fascinating. It sounds like Mitch McConnell didn't say yes, but he didn't say no. <laughs> That's a fair statement. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. That's Senator Bill Cassie, Republican of Louisiana. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we'll talk with Nathan Sheets, Chief Economist at PG, PGM Fixed Income. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. <laughs> 